Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon, and we are back with one of my favorite series, Dissecting the Divine. This is episode eight, where we look at God and Anatomy by Francesca Stravrakopoulou, an incredible book, and if you want to buy it for yourself in any of its forms, see the links in my description below. But episode eight here, Divine Sex, is the fourth and final chapter in part two of the book, where we've been going through the sexual nature of this deity, which I know is such a foreign concept. It has been so cleverly left out of of modern Christianity. And that's why this book is such an eye-opener. She makes great cases. It's right there in the Bible. There's good reasons to understand these euphemisms as we see them all over the scriptures. And again, I understand how uncomfortable and taboo it can be for many of us that were once in the Christian faith to even consider this idea. But the corporality of this God is the point of the book. This God was once thought of, and rightly so, based off the original concepts of him in a very, very physical fashion. But there's still a lot to be said here in this chapter titled, divine sex, where we're really going to look at the sexual exploits of this God himself. Again, I know, but bear with me. Not only is it fascinating, but it's very damning for the version of Christianity that is out there in the world today. So without further ado, let's crack the book open and get to it. Give me a second to get situated. She opens this chapter by drawing our attention to a 13th century BCE clay figurine of the wife of God, or of the biblical God, I should say. And she notes that it is currently in an Israeli museum and is unfairly characterized as this may be Asherah, the sacred prostitute. And this demotion and negative demotion at that of this past goddess is beyond unfair, and she's going to tell us why through the rest of this chapter. And she starts by making the case for the hostility towards Asherah. Now, right off the bat, many of you, if you're coming into this series new or this episode new, you might have no idea who we're talking about. I'm going to lay out some of the landscape that she does in this book as well. So let's just take a minute to do that. You have an older Ugaritic myth. This is the pantheon of which Yahweh comes from. You have the high god Ael and his wife Atheret. They have 70 sons, of which they have many different properties. Yahweh is a son who is a storm or war god and specifically gets handed dominion over the Israelite people. Now, there's some variations of how you look at that Ugaritic myth and exactly when this happens, but we have a tale kind of as old as time where Yahweh usurps his father, Ael, and takes his wife, or in some cases, recreates the wife. And so Atheret becomes Asherah. Asherah was indeed at one time to this chosen people group, a wife of Yahweh. We see traces of that throughout parts of the Old Testament, and we're going to get into some of that. We see where she is just built into these former poems and songs and myths that even the compilation that was happening in the exile or post-exile period did not completely erase. We also see warnings that happen within the Bible of those who still worship Asherah. But we have many other sources outside the Bible that show an equal worship to Yahweh and Asherah, again, as a team, as a partnership, as a husband and wife. There's a huge evolution at work that either tries to remove Asherah or, again, demonize Asherah, as well as separate Yahweh from Ael and the rest of the pantheon to make him this singular god, well, outside of the Trinity. But we just have too much information, too much detail, too much history, too much archaeology to deny how this really started. We even know, and again, I'm covering a lot of what's in the chapter. I'm not just going off on a tangent right now, that the original temples in the northern and southern kingdom would have housed a statue of Asherah right next to the statue of Yahweh or her bearing her likeness, which was sometimes also in tree form, but also sometimes in goddess form. Going back to the Ugaritic myths, we see that she is actually really involved as a true equal in the cosmic creation. She is, in fact, the wet nurse to these kings, raising them up to power and glory. She even defeated the sea monster or the chaos monster, which again plays a large part in kind of the conception of creation and cosmic order. The original, more ancient idea of these goddesses was not on this 
ridiculous sexist level that we get with more of the new interpretations of female gods or newer i should say so let's read a quote here to kind of kick things off as an ancient goddess of the highest caliber her presence in the mythological story worlds of her worshipers underscored the authoritative status of the male deity with whom she was partnered as atherit of late bronze age ugarit this was ale and as asherah in the iron age kingdoms of israel and judah this was Yahweh. While Asherah's relationship with Yahweh is usually presented as an abomination in the Bible, a collection of ancient Hebrew inscriptions sensationally unearthed in the 1960s and 70s confirms her role as his consort. Dated to the 8th century BCE, these descriptions present Yahweh and Asherah as a divine power couple petitioned for protective blessings by their worshipers. She then goes on to list quite a few different inscriptions and artifacts that we have that show that these two were prayed to together. They were worshipped together. They were petitioned for safety together. This completely destroys this idea as this monotheistic Yahweh God who was the sole deity of his worshippers. After the examples, she says this, these appeals suggest that most Yahweh worshippers did not share the biblical writer's derogatory view of Asherah. Rather, they considered her to be the traditional partner of their high God, Yahweh, and they worshipped her as a protective, life-giving goddess able to meet divine blessings to Yahweh's people. So then what happens? Well, she's going to go on to describe to this. So again, we have the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. If you've been following my secular Bible study series, you'll hopefully understand this very well at this point. Israel, the Northern Kingdom, the capital Samaria, is attacked by the Assyrians in 722 BCE, where in the Southern Kingdom of Judah, the capital there, Jerusalem, in 587 BCE, is attacked and captured by the Babylonians. In both of these cases, the temples are destroyed. And with it, it, there goes the last of the Asherah worship because now these people are taken into exile. They are spread about and even when released, don't all make it back to the homeland. We have the diaspora and we have kind of an elite group of refugees that make it back and rebuild the temple and in rebuilding the temple, rebuild the myth, essentially. We also know that it was during this exile and post-exile time that much of the Bible as we have it is amalgamated and compiled and edited and redacted. And these stories that were once maybe just oral or we had just little parts of poetry or scribe have now been collected and put together in such a fashion to present a more cohesive narrative. And even then, we can't escape some of the former myths that we know persisted. Francesca here calls this pantheon reduction. And it's such an accurate term to describe how we have arrived at where we are now, again, with this singular figure of one specific deity erased from his history as a son who usurps his father, as part of a brotherhood, as a specific kind of God, which makes so much sense, again, when we see the early myths that have still made it into the stories here. And so again, Asherah is now recast as a toxic idol and is blamed for so much, especially when it comes to some sexual proclivities. And this is the beginning of the Bible's hang uppery with sex. Before this, again, the original myths of these two together engaged in divine sex and creating cosmic order showed sex as mutually beneficial and had no status or hierarchy within it. That is about to change drastically, and that is a lot of what we are going to continue to cover in this chapter. But before we get to the sin issue of sex, I want to read you a quote where it's from our Bible in Genesis about Joseph, and I think this is really interesting. The incantation invokes a series of deities to bestow sexual masculinity and fruitfulness upon Joseph's penis, euphemistically described as his taut bow and strong hand. Included in the divine roll call is a goddess bearing the title Breast and Womb, a likely epithet of Asherah, given it is used of Atherit, her older incarnation at Ugarit. She is paired in the poem with a deity called Father and Most High, ritual titles of the God of the Bible inherited from Atherit's husband, Ael. So here we go. From the God of your ancestors who supports you, from Shaddai who blesses you, the blessings of heaven above, the blessings of deep crouching below, the blessings of breast and womb, the blessings of your father, warrior, most high. And then this is what she has to say to follow up, and then I'll stop reading here. The coupling of father, warrior, most high, and breast and womb points to the sexualized collaboration of these deities, paralleling the pairing of heaven and deep, the divinized primeval 
primeval parts of the universe, whose union birthed and built the very cosmos. The poem hints at the ancient pantheon in which the coupling of the high god and the high goddess is set within the frame of an ordered, fertile creation. I think that's fascinating. And I remember the first time that I read that, I thought, is this a reach? Is this a stretch? But she goes on to explain why these couplings happened, how they happened in the Ugaritic myths, what they mean, what the euphemisms draw from, where else we see them in scripture and how to connect them. And it becomes painfully obvious just how much this God had to evolve for us to get this incorrect idea that we have about him today, at least compared to the original myths. So even though there's a lot more that I did not cover, we have established our case for Asherah as the wife of Yahweh. We've seen how she gets recast after the exile periods, and now we're going to start to look into what that recasting did and the implications that it had. And this is really going to be around sin. We have our first sin gaining knowledge, then the second sin essentially is murder with Cain and Abel. And then very, very quickly, we get one that is often glossed over. It's hinted at in Genesis, but it's laid out in much more of a thorough case in the Book of Enoch or the Tale of the Watchers. And that is divine sex, at least with other deities in heaven that are not God coming down to earth, they're called sons of God. You might call them angels or lesser deities, etc. But the sons of God come down and they have sex with the daughters of man, the Nephilim, or what the Bible will later call giants in those days. I was a Christian who was fascinated and enjoyed hearing the stories of the Nephilim, but never considered them anywhere near biblical truth, and so had completely dismissed it. These are all tied together in the myth in the lore of this people group. And like all myths, legend, and lore, there's different facets that you can take or believe or different versions of the same story. And all of this is coming from an older story anyways. But this divine sex was bad to God. And in some cases, it's what led to the flood. And it's actually kind of a secondary punishment. At first, God is so displeased that he limits the days to man. And we get the 120 years proclamation. Because remember, people were living 700, 800, 900 years years before this. And then even that's not good enough and we go with the flood and we essentially start over now that we have erased this bad seed from the earth. And so you can read more about it here. And of course, uh, if you haven't checked out the book of Enoch, it's one that I'll cover when we get done with our actual secular Bible study series. God is not so mad or it's not so offensive to him. The concept of divine sex itself, it's that it's for him to do. Now I'm going to bring up an example that many of you are going to struggle with. It slapped me across the face. I immediately, even as a non-Christian, wanted to reject it, but I'm going to read to you how she states it. Here we go. Oh, by the way, as I was looking for the quote, uh, I forgot I wanted to mention this. After she gets done describing the flood myth and the Nephilim and the sons of God that had come down to have sex, she says, it is a story that would remain popular and alarming within ancient Jewish and early Christian circles. Indeed, by the middle of the first century CE, Paul was alluding to it when he insisted that women should keep their heads veiled and covered during prayer and prophecy on account of the angels. I just think it's fascinating to see even in the New Testament, we can't get away from some of these ideas. But this is not what I wanted to bring up. I wanted to bring up this part. God's first sexual encounter occurs long before the birth of the Nephilim. In the Garden of Eden, food from the sacred tree might have been off the menu, but Satan's sexual appetites was divinely ordained. God's pairing of Adam and Eve seemingly comes to fruition when Eve bears Cain, the first human child but her emphatic declaration at the birth of her son credits God, not Adam, with paternity. I know, it's so, so strange, but let's see her case for it. Quote, I have procreated a man with Yahweh. And if you're curious what verse that is, I want to point out that in this book, next to anything like this, where she quotes something, she puts a little number. So then we go to the back here. The number was 10. We need to go to this chapter, and she has an entire notes section is what it's called. So we need to go to chapter 8 and then note 10, and it tells us this is Genesis 4.1. So again, just an example of how cool this book is and where we can always get more information. So again, the quote is, I have procreated a man with Yahweh. This more literal translation of the Hebrew is rarely seen. Most renderings of this verse default to a theologically fudged interpretation so that Eve is merely presented as claiming that Yahweh has helped her to acquire a man, as any good fertility god might. But the very language of this Hebrew text signals a 
bodily dynamic well beyond this, for the woman's words are pointedly precise. She is claiming that Yahweh has fathered her first child. There is nothing virginal about this birth. Eve's boast is indicative of a female sexual agency, wholly unlike the sanitized passivity of her later biblical antitype, the Virgin Mary. Her words reveal she is God's collaborative partner in the creation of new human life. But this proactive role also points to a long-lost mythical backstory to Eve's character. Although in her biblical form, she is a human woman, her choice of vocabulary is the language of goddesses. In asserting that she has procreated a man. She uses a specialized technical term for divine reproduction also used of goddesses in the myths from Ugarit. Indeed, like the Ugaritic goddess Atheret, Eve is called mother of all living, and even her name, Hawa, in Hebrew, likely means life giver or living one, evoking an epithet of Atheret in her glorious title, the lady, the living one, the goddess. These features of Eve's characterization in Genesis suggest that before her biblical career, she was more akin to a life-bearing goddess appropriately located in the heavenly garden of Eden, and hence a most suitable sexual partner for a male deity. So again, so hard to wrap our head around when we have this ingrained Genesis story of God creates man, man is Adam and Eve, they have children, and on and on and on. But it's much more representative of every other myth where Eve is just kind of this deity under Yahweh that is therefore life-giving, and Yahweh, like every male deity ever was not faithful to just one woman and procreates the earth with Eve, the mother of all living, especially considering that Yahweh presents himself as a fertility god. So let that blow your mind for a minute. Dismiss it if you want. Argue it if you want. That's fine. I'm not claiming, by the way, that all scholars agree with her, but this is definitely a good case to be made, and she goes into more detail in the book in making it. So at least check it out for yourself. By the way, I'm just realizing that I had intended a different Saturday video that I've now pushed to tomorrow. So you're probably wondering about this piece and where Sisyphus went. Just check in at the beginning of tomorrow's video, which is another episode of When Christians Respond, You Just Sound Hurt. And I have a lot to say on that one. Don't miss it. Okay, back to this. I would say maybe that's our first half of the book. And I know I've done a lot of reading. This might be longer than usual. But again, we're putting a bow on this final part. And we're going to move into more biblical terms of how God treats Israel as a personified woman and what that looks like and the horror that it causes and the implications that proceed. So let's dive into the second part here. And we're going to do so with a quote from Hosea. Again, <laughs> Lots of quotes today, but her writing is phenomenal. You can't even get mad at it. And it's going to be much more articulate than anything I could do on my own. Honestly, it's hard for me not just to read to you the entire book. And I should tell you before I get to this example from Hosea, just kind of how this God looks. He looks like an alpha male predatory figure who preys on the, at one point, young virginal Israel, but as she betrays him and whores herself out to these other nations. Again, the personification of Israel is that of a girl, a woman, his bride, his sexual conquest, who at some point cuckolds him as she whores herself out to other nations, which he then has to repay her in these sexually horrendous ways with these awful punishments, many of which I have covered again in Secular Bible Study series as we've gone through these books. We get main examples in Hosea and also Ezekiel, but it's all over the Old Testament. So here she is talking about Hosea. The book of Hosea offers a vivid example. Here, Israel is a capricious teenager whose sexual allure so intoxicates God. He falls to scheming obsessively and possessively to make her his wife. I will now seduce her, he says of Israel. I will take her walking into the wilderness and speak to her heart, and there she will cry out. These words betray more than the romantic fantasy of a love-struck deity. God's language here marks a shift from passion to threat. In claiming he will seduce her, he uses a Hebrew expression, more usually employed in the Bible to describe the rape of captive women. And in describing Israel's vocal response, he uses a term that can convey both the noise of sexual gratification and religious joy. God's dangerous sense of sexual entitlement skews his planned attack on the girl into the distorted conviction that she will enjoy her rape and scream in orgasmic ecstasy. 
Again, she lists verses here in the notes for all of this. This image of a sexual violation is unsettling enough, but nowhere in the Bible is the portrayal of God's sex life more disturbing than in two stories in the book of Ezekiel. So we're going to get to those stories. I'll describe them. I'll read you some quotes here, but it is absolutely horrific. You know, this God got to make up his own metaphors and analogies and allegories. And this is something that I don't think we talk about enough. Many times when I list something in the Bible that is even literal, that is supposed to be taken literal, an excuse is, I don't understand the context. This is really a metaphor. This is really whatever. And even if I were wrong in those cases, why can this God not not use horrific metaphors? If he's trying to talk about how Israel has lost her way and how his glory demands justice, could we not find better ways than personifying her as a whore who has wronged him that needs to be punished in a way that represents her sin? Like what's coming up with shaming her by nakedness, cutting off her breasts, having her gang raped, etc., as you are going to see. And again, before we get to the examples, despite the sanitizing process of these Jewish writers still leaking through the pages is this barbaric expectation of a man's right over a woman. And not only is that played out in the culture and in the laws, but it bleeds through even to the New Testament with regard to how women should act and be and submit, etc. When Paul talks so much about preparing the church to be the virginal bride of Christ, he's getting a lot of this from Ezekiel, where Israel is the wife of Yahweh. And that's where we're going to pick up in the Ezekiel stories. Israel is Yahweh's wife. And what do we know about Yahweh? He is a jealous God. And I also love that because anytime I've brought up that God's jealousy is inherently not moral, I am told jealousy is beautiful. It's different than envy. We should be jealous of our partners. When you see how Yahweh's jealousy unfolds, Maybe you want to rethink that statement. Okay, so let's get to this first example from Ezekiel. Here too, Israel is cast as God's wife, but her whoring after foreign deities provokes her husband's fury and punishment. According to Ezekiel, her wanton behavior in marriage is the culmination of a long history of social and sexual deviancy. Their relationship begins in the wilderness, where God finds an abandoned baby girl, her cord still attached, deliberately cast away from the rest of humanity. You were abhorred on the day of your birth, scorns God, as he he reminds her that she had been neither washed of birth blood nor rubbed with a protective salt scrub and swaddled. Again, verses for all of this. And yet God acknowledges her, commanding her to live and grow. And only when she obediently matures to puberty does he notice her again. Reminiscing about the subsequent encounter, God comments, Your breasts were formed, your pubic hair had grown, you were naked and bare. I passed by you and looked at you. You were at the age for lovemaking. I spread the corner of my cloak over you and covered your naked nakedness. I pledged myself to you and entered into a covenant with you. You became mine. The voyeuristic tone to the words is not lost in the English translation, which barely manages to soften the graphic sexual nature of his actions. God's gaze is upon the girl's exposed sexual organs, moving him to cover her genitals, nakedness, with his own, his spreading cloak politely functioning here as an image of his mounting her, much as in the book of Ruth, in which the eponymous heroine urges a sleepy Boaz to have sex with her by spreading the corner of his cloak over her. The sexual euphemisms continue, for it is by penetrating the girl's body that God enters into a binding covenant with her. And again, this girl is Israel. An equal power relationship in which the forging of the deity's exclusive and proprietary claim to Israel is presented as the sexual consummation of a man's possession of a bride. You became mine. Now, she goes on to say so much here. It is so deep. It is so good. It is so explanatory of everything that you might be thinking or have questions on. And I would just encourage you again, get this book because I will never be able to do it justice in these episodes. And I want to keep reading so bad, but instead I'll try to summarize for you. So God has taken this outcast, this small nation of Israel, and as it has grown in front of him, he has desired it. And now as a young girl, but 
more mature still, he takes her. This covenant was never something that Israel just said they wanted. We see that imbalance at play. And now Israel, like a submissive wife who has been captured from the enemy and made to obey and be taken sexually, is stuck in this position with this man, this God. The problem now is going to come when the Israelite people don't properly submit to this God in their worship, in their sacrifices, or even worse, as they start to worship other gods, which again is going to be akin to adultery. And the way that God goes on in Ezekiel to talk about the nature of which Israel is doing this is to continue to personify her as this whore, a whore who's constantly dripping wet with sexual lust, a whore who instead of receiving payment, actually pays others so that they will use her. Again, the degrading terms from God himself, metaphor or allegory or not, are absolutely inexcusable, especially knowing that men are going to take that and see it as a license to treat their women in the same fashion, which is also found in the Bible and has been seen ever since. And I wanted to summarize the rest of the story, but I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. And then we're going to move into the second story from Ezekiel, and then we're going to wrap up. Her punishment is brutal. God gathers her lovers, so this would be the other nations, and strips her naked in front of them. Her legs are wrenched apart, her genitalia exposed. It is an invitation to gang rape her. A mob is summoned to stone her, cut her, stab her, and set her home alight. This scene of graphic, frenzied sexual violence is the theological money shot for the brutality wrought against his wife triggers in God a climactic gratification by which his psychosexual anger suddenly appears spent. Thus I will satisfy my fury on you, and my jealousy shall turn away from you. I will be calm and will be angry no longer. And we get a parallel into the next example here. But what is amazing to me is I've brought up this exact verse in my secular Bible study and in episodes where I've talked about the immorality of this God. And the way that Christians have spun this is to look at that verse and say, look, God forgives. He relents. He calms down. What? This abuser who just participated in the gang rape and has finally climaxed is now, yes, satiated. Is that what you meant to say? I digress. Let's move on to the second example here. A few chapters later, God again looks back on his alleged cuckolding with venomous fury. This time, Israel is personified as two sisters, who represents the cities Samaria and Jerusalem, again, the capitals of the northern and southern kingdom. Their sexual crimes, God claims, begin Again, even before he makes them his brides. In their youth, they seek out the Egyptians, cast as animalized foreigners with penises like those of donkeys and gushing semen like that of the stallions, who squeeze and fondle the young girl's breast and ejaculate over them. Even so, God marries them. But the sisters' sexual depravity only worsens, so much so that they seek out lovers who disgust them and even sacrifice to those lovers the children they have borne their divine husband. God's violent response is again profoundly disturbing. He gathers gathers his wives' lovers who strip the sisters naked and abuse them. One of them has children who are seized, and she is put to death by the sword. The younger sister endures a more prolonged suffering. God again summons her lovers, instructing them to disfigure the unfaithful wife by cutting off her nose and ears, to expose her genitalia, and to burn her children. God then gives his wife her dead sister's cup of desolation and horror, commanding her to drink until she is intoxicated with such sorrowful shame that the cup will shatter in her hands. Most damaging of all, perhaps, is the moral of the tale. The fate of God's wife is explicitly exhibited in this narrative as a warning to all women, lest they too dishonor their husbands, and that is indeed how it is used. And what is it that we are to learn? A, don't cross God, because this is how he shows his love and forgiveness and mercy, and by making it about a woman disobeying her husband who owns her as property, we also get a moral on a more human level of how these women should be conducting themselves and or not conducting themselves, and if so, what the rightful punishment would look like from the man. How any woman finds any value in this God is insane to me. So I'm going to start wrapping this up. There is so much more in this chapter. She goes on to talk about how the rabbis used to explain away and or even not permit people to read these parts. She goes on to talk about one of the church fathers specifically 
basically Origen and how he made apologetics for this kind of stuff. She goes on to talk about Paul's comments in the New Testament and how they are equally and even more disturbing in some cases because they are still to be taken so literally today. Then we get some comparisons with Asherah and Eve and then Mary Magdalene to bring in Jesus and the New Testament that this representative female figure who was important or had a higher value at one point in the original myth is downgrade, recast to the lowly prostitute. This religion simply cannot have women as anything but sexual objects in so many of these cases and she shows that pattern wonderfully. So typically I wrap up by reading you the last paragraph because she does such a phenomenal job. I've read so much to you today. I will not do that. I will just say thank you for watching. I'm excited to dive into part three of this book. Make sure you're around for tomorrow's episode on another episode of When Christians Respond. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Jeffrey, Karen, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.